Upward family, great to see you guys. Everybody doing well? I'm glad to hear that. Let's welcome our online audience today. Would you give them a big hand of appreciation and love to all of them? Many, many are joining us online right now, and we're so glad for you being here as well. We're in the middle of a series, part two of a series called From Death to Life, and we're making the journey from our darkest places into place, into a place of light and of light. Now, naturally, this story in John chapter 11 begins at a funeral. And who would think that a great story like this could come out of a funeral? But when Jesus shows up at your funeral, good things can happen. Now, I got a whole lot of funny funeral stories. Are you ready for another one tonight? I preached a funeral when I was a very, very young minister. I'd come to Henderson County, and I did a funeral with another pastor, a legendary preacher in Henderson County named Harold McKinnis. Anybody remember Harold McKinnis? He was a wonderful man, loved him so much, and he was a powerful preacher. And when you did a funeral with Harold McKinnis, you just said, Lord, help me. I'm going to look bad no matter what I do because he could preach a funeral. But he was a great man, and here I am, 29, 30 years old, and this great preacher's here, and I'm standing at the back of the funeral's home with him, and the funeral director comes up to us, and he said, Preachers, we've got a problem, and I want to ask you, and I want to make sure that it's okay. He said, The uh, family has requested that during the funeral we play a Willie Nelson song, and we want to make sure that a Willie Nelson song is okay with y'all. And I said, oh, it's fine by me. I, I, I like some of Willie's songs, so it's okay by me. And Harold said, I'm not going to stop the family. So the funeral director walked off, and Harold turned to me, and he said, Brother, what are we going to say if it's Whiskey River? <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't Whiskey River, and we didn't have to address anything in the funeral. Jesus had friends in a little town called Bethany that was just on the other side of the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. And this little town was like a vacation spot for him. It was a place, Jerusalem would get hot sometimes, Jesus would go there and really tick off the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And he literally would need a place to escape to, not just to get away to relax, to get away to save himself because its time had not yet come. So often he would take refuge in Bethany, and in Bethany there was a home where three of his friends lived, two sisters, Mary and Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. And Jesus just liked to hang out with them. Do any of you have people that you just enjoy hanging out with? It's okay. Do any of you have people that you know in your life that you love them but you just don't really want to hang out with them. That's okay, too. You know what I'm talking about. You love them. You pray for them. You want them to go to heaven. You want to be like Jesus to them. But you really just don't want to hang out with them because they kind of drain you. I want you to understand, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were the people that Jesus really enjoyed just hanging out with. Those type of people you can just be yourself they don't drain you. They don't ask a lot of you. You can just have fun with them and just hang with them. And that's what Jesus did with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They cooked meals for him. They had celebrations for him. They had done a lot for Jesus. Uh, their house had become kind of like an Airbnb for Jesus, where he could stop at any time and spend the night and have a good meal. They were his friends. So Lazarus, the brother, gets really, really sick. And the ladies think this. Thank God we're friends with Jesus. We've got an ace here. We're going to be okay. Since we and Jesus are buds, he's going to come right here and take care of this problem. And they send word for Jesus, expecting him to come right away because they are really, really close friends. And he doesn't show up in time. Tonight we're going to talk about being disillusioned with Jesus' delays. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I've been living for Jesus earnestly since I was 19 years old. I've been a pastor for uh, 27 years. I've been in ministry. I'm just being very honest with you. I love Jesus, and I know that he loves me. He's proven it to me over and over and over again. 
He's been faithful to me so many times in my life. When I could turn to no one else, I could turn to him. And he has shown up and he has helped me over and over again. I love him and I know he loves me. But sometimes I wonder where he's at. Sometimes I wonder why he's not moving faster. Sometimes I'm in a situation that I know he cares for me. And I think to myself, if one of my children was in this situation and I had the power to fix it, I would drive cross country or fly around the world to help them with it. And God in heaven can just speak a word and change situations And I know He loves me, and I don't understand, knowing how greatly He loves me, I don't understand why He doesn't just speak the word and fix my problem. Am I the only one in the room that's ever felt that way? Can I just be honest? That's natural. That's human. That's okay. Even mature Christians feel that once in a while. Jesus Why aren't you showing up? And we get, which is a popular word, disillusioned. Someone told me once, I'm just disillusioned with the Christian faith. Tonight we're going to talk about disillusionment. But before we do, we need to think about that word maybe in a little bit different way. How many of you, when somebody says, I'm disillusioned, that really sounds like a negative thing. Can you? To me, it sounds like a negative thing. Can I see your hands? This is really not a trick question. I am setting you up a little bit, but um, the word dis... Think about it this way. An illusion is something you believe that's not true. And when you are disillusioned, it means that you got rid of some of the things you believe that weren't really true. I read the definition of disillusionment, and it made me feel a little better about people saying I'm disillusioned. It said disillusionment is to be stripped of false impressions or misconceptions. The word sounds like a negative thing, but it's really positive. When I am disillusioned, it means that I've thrown out a couple of illusions in my life that I was previously believing. And as I read this passage, I thought there are disillusions that in the delay God delivered Mary and Martha from. And I'm learning that the delays are a part of my transformation into the person Jesus is making me to be. When I think Jesus is not showing up on time, He is working to disillusion me and to help me really see the truth of who He is. So tonight we're going to look at two disillusions and two purposes of Jesus' delays. Here's the story. Lazarus is sick and dying. John 11, 3 through 6. It says, So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling Him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, He said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. Think about that. You know the rest of the story. You know Lazarus died. And it seems like Jesus is lying here. His story will not end in death. Well, he did die, but that was not the end. Jesus said this, No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Now here comes the really tough two verses for us to get. John writes it as if he's even understanding how the reader would feel. He's understanding how we here at Upward in 2022 would feel about these words. John says, So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, He stayed where He was for the next two days. He loved them, but he didn't move. Anybody in the building struggle with that just a little bit? When I'm in trouble and I call somebody that loves me, I want them to be there. I count on my friends to help. 
And I've got so many friends. I, I know so many people, and I'm so blessed. Everywhere I go, every store I go into, I know five people. And that's not an exaggeration. My wife goes with me and says, don't talk to everybody tonight. But if I go to Sam's, I'm just having church. I visit 15 people. When we were building this church, I still laugh about it today. We were building this church back in 2004, 2005, and I was over here looking at construction. Maybe we just moved in, and I went down Upper Road, and a car pulled right out in front of me, and I had to spin left. And I did a Dukes of Hazard jump in a Ford Explorer. You try that one day. I did a Duke, if you hadn't seen Dukes of Hazard, you missed out. But it's yeehaw. I went and did a Dukes of Hazard jump right where Biltmore Baptist Church is now, landed all out in the middle of that yard. And somehow stayed upright. I promise you, I know more than got out of my car and I had two phone calls of people saying, Are you okay? My friends saw the wreck. And I was okay. I count on my friends to show up when I need them. And I want to be a friend who shows up when my friends need me. But it says, although he loved them, he stayed where he was. I've learned this about Jesus. You want to be like Jesus? You want to be like Jesus? If you're here tonight watching online, I assume for most of you that's kind of what you want, right? Because you're here. Um, We tend to think about being like Jesus in terms of sacrificial love and in terms of holiness and in terms of healing people and loving people and not losing our temper, but If you really want to be like Jesus, you start being like Jesus in his habits. And this is one that's going to convict you as it convicted me. Jesus never rushed. You never see Jesus anxiously trying to get to the next place. You never see Jesus worrying that he's going to be late to do a miracle. He never rushed. Think about this for a minute. Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years, right? We had God in human flesh for 33 years. He didn't begin his public ministry until he was 30. What? He should have been raising dead people when he was five. I mean, if we've only got God here for 33 years, let's, let's get him going quick. I mean, he's, at least he's teaching in the temple and starting this stuff up. He's got potential when he's 12. He never rushed into anything. Here's the illusion. You ready for this? Illusion number one. If Jesus loves me, he'll fix my problems quickly. It's not true. And if you believe this lie, you're going to constantly live in disappointment with Jesus. Because he does not always show up and fix our problems quickly. Although we really want him to. Mary and Martha are thinking, it's okay, Jesus loves me. He's going to show up, he's going to show up. But sometimes he doesn't show up. Let's get real tonight. Can we get real? This is an exciting, this isn't going to give you a quiver in the liver. But this is the Bible. Eleven of Jesus' twelve original disciples were murdered for their faith. And he did not show up and save them. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, was executed for his faith. And God did not save him. Yet they all died free. Yet they all died with joy. At being able to give their life for Jesus. Why doesn't Jesus show up when we want him to? We're, our family, Alex and I and our family, we're in a season of waiting right now. And I'm not trying just to spill my personal stuff with you, but I just want to tell you, this message, maybe it helps you to understand that we're in a season of delay right now. 
in August, we rushed back from the beach. We were on vacation and rushed back to the emergency room of the beach, and she, they discovered she has this very serious and very chronic anemia. Her body destroys her red blood cells, and we have not yet found out why, and it keeps on happening. We've gotten some really good news. They said it's not some of the big, bad, scary stuff that it could have been, and we're so thankful for that. But yet it continues to happen. In fact, tomorrow she goes back in the hospital to get another infusion again. So uh, we're going to go back and got good doctors and good nurses and wonderful people helping us that we love so much and have grown so close to so many of these people. But I just got to be honest with you folks. I'm ready for this to be over. I'm saying, uh, Jesus, where are you? Do you imagine Mary and Martha thought, you know, Jesus, we cooked you many a good meal. I've washed the sheets from the bed you slept on many a time. Done a whole lot of things for you. Isn't it like when you're in crisis and it seems like Jesus is not showing up, you remember all the stuff you've done for him? Like you really helped him out. It's silly when you think about it, but that's how our human minds are. Jesus, we've been serving you for 27 years. Where are you? We never imagined we'd be in this thing for months and months. But we're asking Jesus to do something and wondering, just honestly wondering, why he already has it. Now, some of you have faced situations far worse than that with much grace and much faith. There are many people listening who right now you're in a greater trial than that. But you understand even better than we do what it's like to be in the midst of a delay when you're saying, God, please answer our prayers. And he doesn't. Because Jesus doesn't always run to fix our problems quickly. Now, I ask myself this. What do you imagine was happening inside of Jesus when all this went on? Mary and Martha send a message to him. He's a little ways away, and he hears, Lazarus, your friend is sick. Now, I want you to understand this. Jesus was fully human and fully God at the same time. So Jesus had human feelings. If he did not have human feelings, he could not be our great high priest because the Bible says he's touched with our feelings, with our infirmities, with our weaknesses. He's felt them too. So I'm going to tell you this, because Jesus was human and he genuinely loved people. When they came to him and said, Lazarus, your friend is sick, he wanted to go right then. But Jesus did not always do what he wanted to do. Jesus said this in the book of John. I told you I'm going to quote John a whole lot to you this year. Jesus said this, he said, the Father loves me, so he shows me what he's doing. And he says, I only do what I see the Father doing. So Jesus got his daily schedule directly from God. The Bible said Jesus many times early in the morning would get up and he'd be off and pray. And he was asking God, I'll guarantee you, what do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to be today? And I believe this. I I know it's dangerous to start guessing what might have happened. Maybe it is, but I'm going to take a chance on it. I believe Jesus genuinely wanted to go, but the Father said it's not time yet. You stay right where you are. And I'll tell you when it's time to go. Then two days later, the father said, now it's time. Why is that? One of my children called me again, I'll say it again, and they've got a need. And I can fix it, I'm going. But here's the deal. You and I don't see what God sees. You and I do not have God's perspective on things. We can see the immediate. He can see the ultimate. And here's the truth that we've got to understand by serving God. My or our immediate good is not always our ultimate good. Can you grasp that for just a minute? Our immediate good does not always produce our ultimate good. I'm going to tell you, folks, this is a principle in life you can just count on. Often what feels good in the short term is horrible in the long term. 
You just look at your life. How good is it to eat a big old candy bar? Anybody like candy? Anybody like chocolate? What's the best can- chocolate candy bar? Yell it out. Hershey's. What? Heath. Twix. Come on. Milky Way. Yeah, I like Milky Way. What? What'd you say, Chance? I hear you back there. Chance's cookies. That's what's good. Young man can bake some cookies. Good chocolate, right? I like Snickers. And what a big old Snickers bar. I got Tony, cameraman on my team. Big old Snickers bar. Man, when you eat a Snickers bar, it really feels good, right? Man, I could eat that three times a day. I do that for six months, I'm in trouble. Because short term isn't always good for long term. How many enjoy working out? There's a few. Not sure they're telling the truth. I just don't know. I don't know about y'all. I enjoy the feeling after I've worked out. But I hate the feeling during it. But exercising your body, hurtful as it may be in the short term, is really good for you in the long term. That's life. God sees our ultimate good when all we can think about most of the time as human beings is what we're feeling immediately. Somebody said we are like a kid watching a parade. You ever watched a parade? We're like a kid that's looking through the knothole of a fence at a parade. And all we can see is what's passing by in the immediate. But God is like a man in a helicopter who's flying high above the parade. And he can see all the way from beginning to end and understand how all the parts relate to each other and understand how the plan's going to unfold. He already knows the end of the story when you're just seeing what's passing by right now. So when he doesn't show up on time to fix our problem right now, we can trust that he's got a plan that he's working out and it's going to come to pass as we serve him. Amen. 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 Now, illusion number two. You ready for illusion number two? Thank you. John eleven twenty three 23 and 24. He gets there. And they go through all the if-onlys. You ever had the if-onlys? If only you'd been here, my brother wouldn't die. I'd only only you'd been here. Verse 23, Jesus said... Your brother will rise again. And Martha does what religious people often do. I know, Jesus. I know. On the last day, he'll rise again. In the sweet by and by, everything's going to be okay, Jesus. I know. Here's illusion number two, and it pulls intention against illusion number one. Illusion number two is this. And they're not true. Miracles have to wait till I get to heaven. Do you see how those two things pull against each other? There's this tremendous tension in John chapter 11 between Jesus not showing up. And then when he does show up, Martha wants to postpone the miracle to the resurrection day, to the last day. It's like this. You can quickly run in a ditch. My dad told me this growing up. He said, if you run off the road... And you jerk the car back onto the road, you're going to run right in the other ditch. The key to driving is to stay out of both ditches. And the ditch on this side says, Jesus is going to show up immediately and fix all my problems. Anytime I call him, he's going to be there and boom, solve it. That's one ditch. There's a ditch on the other side that says there's not going to be any miracles until we get to heaven and God's going to solve everything then. Until then, we just got to suffer. The supernatural has to be postponed until Jesus comes back and takes us to heaven. That's also a ditch. The truth lies in the tension somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle of that is the truth. Jesus told her, verse 25, 
I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Jesus is saying to Martha, don't be talking about the resurrection as some future event. The resurrection is standing here talking to you. I am, Martha, the resurrection and the life. There's two words in the Greek for time. One of them is chronos. Everybody say chronos. Chronos just means time as it moves forward. Time as we measurement. Seconds, minutes, and hours. That's chronos, and we all live in chronos. But there's another Greek word called kairos. Everybody say kairos. And the Greek word kairos means God's appointed time. Here's the deal. The kairos can show up in your chronos. Nobody's going to tweet that. That won't make it on the Facebook. But the miracle moment is when God's appointed time shows up in our time. And there are times that Jesus wants to show up in a big way here and now and do a miracle in our lives here and now. We just have to be patient in Kronos and wait for the Kairos. We have to be patient as we move through time until we get to God's appointed time. And we have to continue to serve Him and love Him and be faithful to Him and let the delays produce something in me. See, there's a purpose in the delays. During, number one, during my delays, here's two purposes, and I'm going to quit. During my delays, Jesus is glorified. When they're, when they're, the delay, I've already read this scripture to you, but he said, when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. When I'm in a season of delay, Jesus is getting glory. When I serve him through suffering, people see him in a way that they don't see him when I'm all happy. Are you with me? Fake people. You ever run, run into a fake person? You ever run into one of those Christians that just always seems to have victory? It's like that Jesus smile is just painted on their face. I'm about like you. Nobody's got the victory all the time. Nobody's really got their act together that much. And when I get around a person who always tries to act like they've got it all together, I tend not to trust them because I feel like they're faking that and they'll fake something else. Just being honest with you here. If you can't handle the heat, stay out of the kit. No, sorry. I don't like fake. I like to be able to sit down with somebody and they say I'm hurting, but I'm still believing. I don't understand, but I'm still trusting. Jesus gets glory in that. And I'm going to tell you, friends, in our little delay, and forgive me if I'm giving too much testimony in this, but in our delay, we have seen God's glory. He has given us a peace that passes understanding. That does not mean we've never been afraid, that does not mean we haven't cried. That does not mean we haven't gotten angry. But in the middle of it, he's been there. In our trials and in those delays, he connects us with all kinds of people that we never would have known before. She got the same wonderful nurse, Carla, that sticks her arms once a week. She's gotten so good at that, she just holds out her arm. Hit me with your best shot. And we've come to love Carla. 
And we've been able to talk to Carla about Jesus and pray with her. We've got a wonderful doctor. I wish you could meet our doctor. Oh, he's the most wonderful guy. I love him. He's so funny. He wears crazy socks. And if I comment on his socks, he will untie his shoes and take them off to show me his socks. He's that crazy. We've got to know him and become friends with him. We got to talk with a lady in the office who's a cancer survivor. In the clinic where she goes to get her blood drawn, they do chemo just down the hall. And we see little old men, little old ladies going down who are battling cancer. And I just pray for people in that place. I'm telling you, Jesus is getting glory as we walk through a delay. Whenever you're in the midst of a delay, just say, God, Father... Father, what are you doing here? Because I want to be doing what you're doing. So number one, in our delays, Jesus gets glorified. Here's the second one. During my delays, during our delays, our faith grows. We learn to trust Jesus in a deeper way than we've ever trusted him before. John eleven fifteen 15 is a pretty remarkable verse. He's actually walking back to Bethany with the disciples. And he says this, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Jesus let Lazarus die so he could raise him from the dead. He let that trial go farther than anybody had ever seen a trial go before because he knew he was able to even bring him back from the dead. And he told his disciples, now you will really believe. Let me tell you something we believe in. Lex is here tonight and she would say amen to this. We have come to believe in the love of the body of Christ during the last five months more than we ever have in our lives. I told people five months ago, pray for 14. That's the number we're shooting for. Hemoglobin needs to be 14. Will you pray for 14 for us? Just go to God and say 14. He'll know what you're talking about. One of our wonderful greeters, Brownie, comes to me every Sunday. He said, we got 14 yet? We had not got it yet. When we come back from the beach, it was four and a half bad we're aiming for 14 but you know brownie comes to me every week every week that i come here i tell the same story 50 times you know what i do now i just go ahead and get a script ready for every week i know what i'm going to say because people are going to ask me how are you guys doing I hope you don't get offended when I say a script, but I know I'm going to have to tell this story 50 times, and I want to make sure I know what to say. You say, do you get tired of that? Not for a second. Because every time somebody says, how are you? The love of Jesus is there. Amen. We have come to believe in the midst of this delay. We've come to understand the love of the body of Christ. And it's been so powerful to see. We've never felt more loved by God's people than we have over the past five to six months. Because when you go through a delay, your faith just grows. And I can say this, her and I are closer to each other and we're closer to Jesus than we've ever been through this. And one day, I don't know if I'm ready to say this right now, but one day, we'll be able to look back and say, thank you, Lord, that we went through that. Because we see what you've done in us. It's okay to walk through a delay, my friends. Okay? It's okay to be angry during a delay. It's okay to question God during a delay. He's big enough to handle it. Here's what we got to do. Stay out of the ditches. Don't expect Jesus to rush in and solve every problem. But on the other hand, don't postpone the miraculous until heaven. God's going to invade Kronos with Kairos in your life. 
Give God glory during this trial. And let Jesus build your faith. Amen. Amen. This is the first time in my history that I've ended a sermon on time to the second. The end. Boom. Zero. Done. Woo. Hit it. <laughs> now I'm going to talk some more and ruin it. Would you bow with me? Jesus, we love you tonight. Thank you for the privilege to serve you, to love you. Thank you for your word that's so real to us. And we ask you tonight in Jesus' name, touch people. God, there are people watching today. There are people right here in this room that are in the middle of a season of delay. They're walking through Kronos and they're waiting for Kairos. Living in time, waiting for that appointed time when you do what none of us can do. Jesus, we live to glorify you. May we not drive off into a ditch and get disappointed when you don't show up in our timing. May we not drive off into the other ditch and try to push miracles off into some sweet by and by day way out there. But may we just live in this delay and glorify you in it and have our faith built. I ask this in Jesus' name with every head bowed and every eye closed online as well watching this beautiful day. If you're here or watching, today's your day to say yes to Jesus. If you've not said yes to Jesus, today is your day just to say yes to him as a Savior and Lord of your life. If you're here in this place today. You say, Pastor, today I'm saying yes to Jesus. Could I see your hand really quick? Really quick. We won't embarrass anybody. Yes, yes to Jesus. Isn't that good to see? Yes to Jesus. Online, there's a button there that you can press online to say yes to Christ. We can get in touch with you and give you some next steps for you to take. If you're saying yes to Jesus, I invite you just to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me, for dying for me. And I ask you now to forgive my sins. Come live in my heart. Change my life and be my Lord. And from this day forward, I'm your disciple. I'm your follower. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. I wonder a second question really quick. How many would say, Pastor, I'm in a season of delay right now. I'm waiting on God to do something and believing Him to do something. And I'm ready for that Kairos moment to invade my Kronos time. Can I see your hand right now? A bunch of hands. Jesus, thank you that we're all in this together, living in this together, walking in it together, that nobody in this place, nobody online is alone. The body of Christ is here. God, I pray for some people in this place to have the courage to talk about this with somebody else. Some of them are struggling in silence. And God, you've put people in their lives they can trust. And I pray that you give them the grace and the courage to talk, to feel and experience the love of the body of Christ like so many of us have. And I just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You just lift your hands. I want to bless you. Right there, right here in this place, right there in your home, right there where you're watching. I want to bless you with the Aaronic blessing in the Old Testament. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. And may he give you peace. Amen. I commission you now to go out of this place in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And take Jesus to your world, his presence, his love, his joy into your world. Amen. You're sent. Love y'all so much. Thanks for being with us today. Stay warm. Stay safe. Good to see you. Love you so much.